<laughs> All right, the red button's on, okay? All right. So, uh, hello. My name is Adam. Uh, I don't have internet on my computer, so I'm going to be presenting in a semi-janky way. So I apologize in advance. It's just going to look like a PDF on the screen. But we're going to do our best here. Um, I want to say how awesome it is to be here with all of you, several familiar faces. Uh, really miss seeing all of you. This is great to connect and uh, really appreciate all the, the organizers and everybody that, you know, really just worked endlessly and tirelessly to make this event happen for all of us. Uh, but again, you know, great to see all of you. Uh, glad we're here. Yeah, let's dive in. Uh, so I kind of went through the last couple years with COVID and, and I kind of got on this like dry spell. I've presented a lot of different talks before. Most of them are technical. Some of them are about management. Some of them are all over the place, security, whatever. Um, and I just kind of like was like, ah, I'm not really, nothing's hitting me. And um, then uh, I was sitting at the dinner table uh, and somebody on Slack had pinged me and said like, you know, hey, like, is Drupal doing well? And I was like, huh, maybe, but I didn't know the answer to that, right? So I actually decided, I'm like, well, maybe I need to try to answer that question. But I also, at the same exact time, I, you know, had read some really silly blog posts that people would make these outlandish opinions about different things, and I'm like, eh, I don't really think that's kind of cool. So I wanted to kind of go the next level deeper of really trying to understand uh, Drupal, right? So I created a talk called Evaluating the Landscape of Drupal Competition, because I truly want to understand what's going on like in the world, right? And um, a little bit about me. So I'm Adam. Real picture, by the way. Absolutely, right? Uh, <laughs> things that I enjoy. Um, Really enjoy craft beer. I love uh, hanging out with my family. I enjoy barbecue, like real foodie. Uh, I also enjoy running, although it doesn't look like it. Um, I, you can find me roaming uh, the halls of coffee shops in central Pennsylvania. That's where I come from, about four hours away. Uh, I actually rent an office above a coffee shop, and I keep trying to convince them to run a caffeine line through the floor so I can just wire it in. They won't, haven't done it yet. And uh, my, my role in the world uh, professionally is I'm a senior director of engineering at Acquia. Um, I do all kinds of fun stuff. If you ever have any issues with Acquia, questions, comments, anything about our products, certainly feel free to let me know. I'm always happy to help. Uh, but we care a lot about making sure that uh, all of you get a great experience from that. Uh, so yeah, certainly hit me up. So a little bit about this talk. So I want to kind of frame it in terms of like how we're going to get through this, right? Uh, we're going to start by looking at the CMS market kind of holistically. I'm going to give you a bit of a survey of uh, different CMS-related products. Uh, then we're going to hit Drupal as a product. How do we define it? What do we look at it as? How can we classify it? Uh, some field analysis and then a future Drupal positioning. I think that's the part you all probably really would be eager to hear about. Uh, at least I thought it was the most exciting part, but we'll see. All right, warning. Big warning here, okay? Like, these are opinions. There is no, this is not a space of fact. It's not a space of like, you know, whatever. There are definitely going to be opinions in this talk. If that's something that you're not comfortable with, you know, feel free to, you know, you can go see another talk if you want. But like, I'm just literally letting you know that like, this is not a hard science. This is something that I tried to gather information, gather different opinions, different thoughts. And I tried to aggregate that and put it together in a cohesive manner for you. Okay. But again, opinions, 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 all right? Cool. So what approach did I use? Um, so basically, uh, I tried to like just take a look at the, like these definitions. How do you actually define it? How do you, cry, you know, build criteria and evaluation criteria to actually understand what a CMS product is, where it fits, how it, like, what audience it serves, et cetera? Um, I also tried to like go and look at like supporting data. Like I wanted to find actual evidence. I don't want just opinions, like somebody writing a blog post saying, oh, Drupal's great or Drupal's crap or WordPress is great or WordPress is crap. It's like, no, I actually want the real thing. I want to know why they're saying it, right? So I tried to find actual data. But one thing I did do was I tried to also not be super biased. So I actually went and tried to read like 
I think ultimately I probably read like 100 blog posts and different articles, different comparators and everything like that, looked at various sources and sites. So I tried to get pretty informed in that regard so I didn't like get hung up on like one thing or you know anything like that. Uh, and I really tried to look at like, you know, what are things that are similar, what are things that are different as I was like reading through and trying to, you know, kind of gather that court of public opinion around Drupal and, and the other products in the space. But again, the big thing is the evidence, right? I was really trying to drive towards like, why are people saying this, right? Like, is there any truth or validity to this? Uh, and some there was, some there wasn't, right? And then finally, I took a look at like, what, what you know, from this learning, where could Drupal look ahead and try to understand how it could compete better in certain markets or in certain ways? So hopefully that makes sense, all right? So let's dive straight in. Let's take a look at the CMS market. Now, the reason why I focused on the CMS market, even though Drupal is more of a framework and et cetera, is more, it's, it's broader, right? And that's, you know, you have different things that kind of come in product-wise that you can look at. And so I thought it was the right segment to hit as I was doing this analysis. So who are some personas? Let's actually just start by looking at like the people, right? So who works or interfaces in with a CMS product? We've got implementers, so we've got the developer communities, the builders, the configuration folks. We've got people that do visual styling, design, and theming. Uh, we also have the IT staff that's like running the infrastructure behind the scenes. And then we have users. We've got the, uh, the people that are actually using the content management system, the editors, the authors, the managers, uh, marketing folks are often involved, and purchasers. So these are like the space of folks that are kind of getting into uh, this realm. Um, few probably realize that the entire CMS market is $123 billion in total addressable market, okay? There is a ton of money in this market, and it is considered by every analyst that I've seen, everything that I read, as a growth market. Um, and this is the total addressable CMS market projected in 2026 by that source, CMS market share. And a lot of this growth is projected largely because of COVID. So many businesses went digital, right? They just like threw all their stuff online, uh, you know, whether it was like posting hours or what they were doing for takeout, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a ton of stuff going on in, in this market specifically. It's a very hot and growing market. So let's actually try to take a look as we begin to analyze the competition of what criteria do people really give a crap about whenever they're looking at these things. All right, so um, in the field, people, I, I read all different blog posts and considerations and everything. As, as I was doing that, these are the things that spoke to me as what you know, criteria people were evaluating. Everything from accessibility to extensibility. What do you get out of the box? Is the product usable? Can you extend it? Can you model content? Can you interface with third-party integrations? Uh, is the community vibrant? Or like, is, is there like good energy or good you know, progress with the tooling and everything like that? Does it offer workflows? Does it have good documentation? Uh, is, you know, do they actually have policies around things like end of life and like, you know, how, what's the level of management that you would expect to have to support it? And like, you know, uh, one thing that I thought was actually really cool was uh, the partners and vendor ecosystem too. That was something that people like were raving about when I was reading because uh, they actually want to see that there's human beings there that they can pick up the phone and call if they decide to use Drupal or use WordPress or whatever. Uh, DevOps was another... But anyway, you can kind of read this uh, at your leisure, but as we talk through certain things, you'll see exactly why, uh, where Drupal and, and others kind of fall in this space as we talk through it, so. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then from a product perspective, I think you have to understand also what the segmentation is in these various markets, right? So like trying to understand, okay, like, where and how, uh, what segments does Drupal serve? What segments does WordPress serve? Or what segments does Wix or Squarespace serve, right? And these are where the adoption falls, right? So how are you looking at like the small to medium sized businesses and enterprise and everything like that? But then the CMS market segments as well kind of fall into both the traditional space, a headless CMS or an e-commerce based CMS, right? Uh, and then a lot of CMSs also get broken down, whether it's delivered by uh, platform as a service or if it's delivered as software as a service, right? 
So you kind of have these different segments that you can hit and look at as you're also going through this analysis. One key data point that really stood out to me, and it explains everything if you look at it holistically, is 99.9% .9 of the businesses in the world fall under SMB based on how their finances go, right? And this was reported from uh, the US, and this is US focused, sorry, if I should be clear on that. Uh, this is from the Small Business Administration and the, the definition or criteria is any business with fewer than 500 employees, right? And so 31.7 or million businesses classify as a small business in this criteria. And so you can actually see, you know, a little bit of some analysis. I linked to that here. And then if you also compare like a broader IT budget, like let's say somebody's looking at adopting Drupal or looking at adopting, you know, WordPress or a CMS, you have to look at like, what are they looking to spend? And, and it changes a lot based on the size of the company, right? But there was a really key thing that when I read this article that actually also resonated with me, that the larger the size of the company, the more that they gravitate towards a pass offering, okay? So they actually want something with more code, uh, you know, managed offerings for the infrastructure, but more extensibility. And, and they do that um, looking more of a developer persona or like enabling the developers that they have, um, you know, which focuses a lot on the tooling and, and command line tools and DevOps and things of that nature, right? Uh, then smaller companies. So smaller companies have less budget but they want more value and less management, which falls more into SaaS. So good, good criteria there. So my big claim from looking at some of the, you know, field business related data is enterprises will go towards pass. SMB favors SaaS because it's all about budget. It's all about extensibility and getting value, time to value, et cetera. So that I think was clearly speaking to me as I was going through and analyzing. Yeah. Um. Can you clarify a little bit, because I'm a little confused, so the difference between platform as a service versus software as a service? Yeah, so uh, I consider, especially in the CMS market, PaaS is they give you access to code, but they run all your systems, uh, and then you can, you know, extend, uh, it's kind of like what Pantheon, Acquia, Platform, et cetera, all those folks offer, right? Um, but uh, the SaaS is more like the Wix and Squarespace. Like you're not really changing the code. You you might be like, oh, here install this plugin on their site, or like, you know, here's a starter theme. Click on that, you get it, and then you yeah. just get access to use the the CMS as it is. But you're not extending it. You're not like you know loading in a custom you know CRM system into it or something, right? So. So Aquia is a pass, and mm -hmm. what we're doing is uh, here at Princeton is, is like a SaaS. Awesome, so hopefully that makes that makes sense, but um, yeah, good question, thank you. All right, so if we're looking at like mapping the criteria that we used earlier in the talk to where these market segments fall, uh, the pass experience focuses a lot on customizability, extensibility, and being unassuming. So you get like generic services, but you can do whatever you want with those services, so to say, right? Uh, and then, the, the past experience requires more investment, uh, maybe more platform expertise or more technical help to enable that, uh, but it also can meet or address uh, the enterprise level complexity, so it's actually meant to be extensible by default, uh, you know, but, uh, but it has a lower time to value. If you have to build or assemble or maintain code, you're, you're kind of working in a longer cycle to enable a site to be built or developed depending on your needs. But where PASS falls in really well is also in like the regulatory and sort of system integration spaces because you often have to do a lot of uh, unique things, right? And so uh, a lot of enterprises want that because they can wire it in with all of their ecosystem of various systems like their Salesforce or their CRM or their this or their that. So PASS fits very well for that. So um, the SaaS layer tends to go much more towards SMB where they, you know, maybe a small business only wants like a certain set of features and they find which SaaS offering works for them and they just enable it and they can, you know, build a website in 15 minutes, so to say. And, uh, but it's less extensible. It might be a little more configurable or it is configurable in some ways, but very predictable ways. It's heavily focused on usability, but not, you know, deep extensibility. Uh, and also has like usage based and predictable pricing. That's the thing that's also like really cool about uh, SaaS is like 
hey, 15 bucks a month and I got a website and that's all it cost me, right? And you can make use of a service. And generally where um, this usability kind of comes in is in the documentation, also in the support, like great help pages. You know, you can pick up the phone and call somebody from a company. And so SMB loves that because then they don't have to run an IT staff, right? They don't have to go and pay technical people or an agency or whatever to go and enable them, right? So good stuff. But at the end of the day, and I think this is what a lot of people kind of highlighted as I was reading, and I agree, that businesses still end up choosing their path based on what their core needs are, right? So even some small businesses uh, still may choose paths if they have, if their business demands something that is, uh, requires more extensibility, right? Uh, to put it bluntly, right? So, um, but again, we're talking in generalities, we're talking in, in trends, not, you know, every edge case. Cool. All right. Section number two, the survey of CMS products. All right. So the claim, I want to make kind of a generic claim where I, like the way I'm framing this mentally is we have niche CMS products and we have more generic CMS products. Okay. And I think you'll see why I'm classifying this shortly. So let's kind of start with like more of the generic and framework based ones. And I, I lump these into the, the pass offerings, right? Where you have like Joomla, WordPress, and Drupal, and they offer you code, and it's open source, and you can do whatever you wanna do with it. It's a framework, you can install whatever modules or plugins or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can write your own custom code. Uh, and so, you know, it's more framework driven, but it's purely suited for a pass case, right? Uh, and some common criteria of, of these kind of general purpose frameworks, right, of like, Okay, you're gonna get out of the box features that Drupal or WordPress or anything offers. So I call those like base level features and capabilities. Uh, it's a heavy, heavy focus in the developer ecosystem and the open source communities. Deep extensibility, um, highly configurable for a large number of cases. That makes it not niche by the way, right? Because if you can configure it to do 10 million different things, it's not hitting a specific use case. And the main thing is really around like the whole ecosystem of plugins and modules and projects and, and everything that you can take advantage of and that's its main value add basically, right? Then we have like what I would call more traditional CMS product but they're SaaS delivered. So this is where the Wix, Squarespace, Weebly kind of approaches come in. And how do they like classify themselves? They're more niche, okay? They are extremely focused on like paid proprietary offerings with a core set of features. Sometimes they come in and they're more uh, free tier or you could like use them up to a certain point, uh, but then you have to pay after a certain point. Uh, and so um, they've really focused a lot on usability and like the editorial experience, making it really easy to use, get a website spun up quickly. And one thing that they often do is promote kind of omni-channel content delivery so they'll have plugins for things like, you know, plug your uh, CMS into uh, Google Analytics and, or plug it into like, you know, notifications for your phone or something like that, right? Where you can kind of like use that to, as a launching point to, you know, push content in a bunch of different directions. Um, but their main focus is really on low or no code experiences, right? Where they're really trying to kind of hit like a traditional CMS page building capability and that's really it, right? Um, so uh, their main sort of niche, the reason why SMB tends to go towards this niche is really for the time to value. They wanna get stuff out the door as quickly as possible and not have to maintain it. And so often that's why there's a heavy focus on documentation and training and help pages, support offerings, et cetera. Uh, there are some feature offering or feature add-ons I would say, like often they're like vetted partners because they're proprietary. They're like, oh sure, like, um, here's a partner for search or something and you can just click a button and install this paid add-on, but you have to have your, you know, you have to buy the product from the search company too, right? So like that's kind of the way that they frame it. So there's sort of like these ecosystems, but they're more like business to business based ones in, in a proprietary uh, section. All right. The next one is like the sort of headless CMS space too. And this one's getting pretty hot, you know, with like Gatsby and things kind of coming out, um, you know, for static site and, and for cell and Netlify, you know, offering that kind of hosting. So headless CMS, uh, all SaaS driven really, it's like Contentful, Content Stack, Graph CMS, 
All of these allow you to manage content, but it's not meant to display the content. It's meant to just serve it through APIs. So um, heavy, heavy, heavy focus on the editorial experience. Uh, actually, I'll get to it here. Uh, they're paid, same SaaS-based offering. They're paid proprietary, often have free offerings, but uh, you can you know, limit the usage and then get better usage or more usage after that if you pay for it. Uh, really heavy focus on the content editorial experience. Um, you know, where you can model content, make it interoperable through the APIs. Often they have an ecosystem of consumers, so you could say like, oh, here's your headless CMS, but send it to this consumer, or send it to that consumer, and they allow you to enable and turn that on so that there's like, you know, awareness between the two systems. Uh, but again, very heavy focus on like out of the box, uh, still heavy focus on SMB, you know, because it's not, uh, it is SaaS delivered. Uh, but a lot of developers like these tools as well because it just delivers a very discrete capability. Um, and again, uh, often like third-party integrations happen through paid partnerships. It's still business to uh, business, to business in that sense. You can look at the e-commerce CMS products in a very similar way, but instead of it being headless, it's actually more focused on starting like a shopping cart experience. And then you build out a CMS from there where they give you page building that complements that. So that's what Shopify is trying to do. Magento hits some of that. Squarespace has some of that as well. So you can kind of see like roughly what that's looking at. But again, the, the criteria are the same for this, right? It's like, you know, uh, no code, configurability, experience heavy, support heavy, uh, time to value is promoted, right? But in this case, it is exclusively around the experience of a shopping cart. I want to sell something online. But one thing that's unique about e -com is these CMSs often have to have partnerships. Like you have to buy a payment gateway, you have to wire that in so that you can process your payments. So like these ones are way more like community driven, uh, whereas um, you know, like a headless CMS as an example is much more focused on being a specific capability. Cool, all right. Hopefully that helps set the stage, right? So let's look at Drupal as a product, all right? Let's take a look at where Drupal really hits. I wanna start by saying something that I don't think our community talks about this enough. Um, I know we are all you know, here, we care about Drupal, we wanna learn about Drupal or contribute to it in our own way, but I don't really feel like we look at Drupal quite through the lens of a product all the time. I think we see it through like, you know, oh, um, we're gonna push issues into these issue queues and we're gonna enhance the developer community and push patches and do things like that which all make Drupal great and, and help it to be really vibrant and awesome. Uh, but I think the product perspective is one that's more outward, right? Uh, it's not about enabling the developers, it's actually more like enabling the market, right? Or enabling the consumer of it, right? So we spend a good bit of time on the one side, but I don't think we always look at the other side, right? And so um, I kind of posed a few basic questions like what is the market seeking and how is Drupal competing in the market and where is Drupal lagging in the market, right? These kind of questions don't really seem to come up in the general discord of things and maybe it should. But I think today it's not really looked at as a product. It's more looked at as like a, you know, developer community. So I think we need to kind of keep this perspective at the forefront as we begin to make some decisions with Drupal moving forward. Um, this slide was, I want to say, the slides were done before DrupalCon. Uh, and I'll hit this up sort of in the last slide that I added a little addendum to this talk. But, but Drupal's product positioning is around what, what was previously called ambitious digital experiences, right? But I, but I kind of asked another, you know, a few kind of prodding questions about this too. Like, what differentiates a, an ambitious Drupal experience or digital experience from a non-ambitious one, right? I don't really understand it, right? So, like, what does ambition apply kind of a lens of complexity or, like, you know, a certain market segment that, you know, some we care about, some we don't? I don't know, right? Does ambitious suggest, like, that it requires investment to be used? I, like, there's things that I just don't quite understand about that framing. Um, but it also somewhat implies that the market is a little more niche, right? And, and I also think that it is trying to speak to this notion of extensibility, and, but a lack of opinionation. That you can take it and use anything and do anything you want with it. But again, I don't know, it's kind of just a little odd to me. Um, not that I dislike it, but I just think it's, it's hard to qualify it. Um, 
But Drupal does have a lot of key logos. Like, I mean, I'm sure everybody in the room knows it. Like, it's adopted by a lot of major enterprise players. You know, GE, Lowe's, DocuSign, Pinterest, the econ econo bleh, Economist, the IRS, University of Michigan, Princeton, obviously, right? And, you know, and it spans many, 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 many different verticals. Like, it's not hitting, you know, just one vertical. It's hitting pretty much all of them, actually, right? But serving them in a specific way. Um, so a little bit of some market data, right? So the W3 text uh, has like a usage and positioning thing. So Drupal is used by about 2% of all known CMS websites, 1.3% of all websites total. Uh, you can see a dichotomy based on Drupal 7 through Drupal 9, and that's a little bit scary, I think, um, knowing that there's still 59% of running Drupal sites in Drupal 7. Um, it also has less adoption than the competitors, but it's positioned to serve a lot of what they call high traffic websites. That's, and you can see the chart that's like listed here where Drupal's like way over and very, very well performing on the high traffic websites. And you can imagine high traffic websites being enterprise websites. It's, the two, I think, are very much analogous. All right. Uh, also, you can see just in a general sense that, like, you know, if you do Google Trends and you try to understand Drupal as a term, how is it performing? I mean, since basically 2016, it seems to ha hit kind of a high part, but it does seem to be coming down. Um, you know, uh, and this is presented without commentary. The built with data also is another lens to kind of break it down based on some of the other competitors that they consider with Drupal. Uh, WordPress has about 36.5% of the market in CMS, where Drupal is a close second. Uh, and that was me being smart, sorry. Um, not a close second, uh, with 3.5% and right on the heels of Plesk, which I think is kind of odd to put it in the same categorization. But you can see that listed here uh, you know, for, for reference, okay? Um, but let's kind of try to summarize Drupal as a product. Let's like kind of hit it now. We've hit all the criteria, we've hit the segments, we've hit the fields, et cetera. So I think it's strong in enterprise and really strong in pass, right? Uh, even though the adoption and the market buzz tends to be trending down, I think it's okay. It's actually still performing well inside of its market, like that it's going after. Um, and it is still, it's strong. Like it actually is still, you know, serving a lot of these enterprise cases extremely well. Uh, which again comes back to that high traffic enterprise use case. But it does, like, when, especially when I wrote this, I feel like there's still confusion around what market positioning it wants to have. Like, what is its identity? What does ambitious digital experience actually mean? And it has, uh, I think the risk to Drupal is really its heavy adoption that's still in Drupal 7 when all this innovation is happening with Drupal 8, 9, and 10 and moving away from that. Um, and also kind of the lack of opinionation and broad extensibility somewhat like hurts the time to value, but also like doesn't quite let people know uh, who want to adopt it or might consider adopting it exactly what it can do for them, right? So that's something just to keep in mind. All right, so let's do a little bit of some field analysis now. I'm trying to keep this going because I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I'm running out of time. Uh, so Drupal and WordPress are really the two things that are often compared in this uh, market. So what, what's WordPress's kind of profile? It's its closest Drupal competitor. It's open source, PHP, CMS framework, a lot of out-of-the-box features like Drupal, uh, add-ons for headless and commerce, uh, large developer community ecosystem, contributed tools, similar addressable market to Drupal, but more adoption. So... WordPress has 64.9% and rising of all of the CMS market. This was as of June 2021. You can see a link if you want to go back and reference that. Uh, you can, just to re repeat this slide, um, to, we already covered Drupal, but to cover WordPress, it's used by 65.3% of the sites coming from uh, W3 Tech's usage uh, stats and 43.4% of all known websites. Uh, it has more adoption than its competitors, but it's positioned for low traffic sites. It's actually, you can see, it's not quite performing as high as Drupal on the chart, right? Uh, also, just a reminder of the built width data, you can see WordPress, again, is 36.5%. So if we kind of put our court of public opinion on, I read all these blog posts, I tried to understand what's going on, what are people really saying about it? How is it hitting the market in certain ways? Let's take a look. Um, items in... Uh, I guess blue on the screen, but it's green on mine. 
uh, that Drupal really hits a few segments and a few criteria very well. Accessibility, multilingual, security, content modeling, extensibility, regulatory, and performance. That's, everybody said that, everyone. Every blog post I read, every analysis I read, those things stood out on time and time again, okay? So that's one way to look at it. Now where it didn't perform as well was around time to value. Uh, also around uh, updates, you know, people said things like, oh, it's really technical and I always have to like, you know, I need to know Composer and I need to do this and I need to do that. Uh, the learning curve for using Drupal, a lot of like Drupalisms, as they say, right? You, you've seen that like, you know, the cliff, right? Yeah. Image before, right? Uh, so, uh, so usability is actually hampered by that. It's not just learning. And then theming, they actually, uh, we'll talk about theming in a little bit, but they highlighted it as actually a downside of Drupal, believe it or not. Uh, some of the strengths of Drupal, though, is like its framework is highly extensible. It can meet enterprise demands. There's, you know, 48,000 different modules and things you can install. Um, it's really pushing a more modern developer workflow with Composer and uh, things like that. A lot of favorable comments around the Drupal security team and the posture of security and updates in Drupal, uh, getting release cadences out, getting security releases out, and really just like everyone said that it, it's extremely robust. Like, this, as a CMS product, you can literally do anything with Drupal, and that favored very, very, very well, um, and for a number of different reasons, and I captured some of them on here. Uh, but some of the weaknesses, like steep learning curve, it's very hard to use. You often have to pay somebody to help if you don't have technical staff that know the product. Uh, you know, often requires development and a heavy amount of configuration. Uh, but the, the number of features actually makes it less usable because you can do so much and you can figure it like crazy. Um, and uh, distribution seems to be something people thought was kind of favorable, but it wasn't implemented the right way, like in Drupal where it kind of has a lock-in thing. And we'll talk about that with the Drupal Con keynote in a, just a moment. Um, and the one thing that with, uh, in comparison to WordPress in particular, is there isn't any theming that is highly configurable like you can't uh, at least to my knowledge there isn't a theme that comes out of the box with Drupal that you can readily change the colors change the fonts put your branding in upload your image up put a logo etc and that actually hurts because WordPress has it right so uh, it's a big area of weakness I think uh, I did the same for WordPress so looking at it where they said the time value is better usability was better theming like I just said uh, updates, they said, uh, were easier. You can do that through the UI. Uh, and I know Ted Bowman's like, working on that. Uh, also highlighted the community. But where it didn't really perform was around performance. Uh, the out-of-the-box experience, like people said, was kind of eh. Like, uh, and also like security. They said, especially comparing Drupal, like that WordPress, um, you know, because, and I, I can explain why, but, um, and I will. But the security part of it, I think, is misleading as it was presented by people in the world. Uh, and I'll talk about exactly why that is um, shortly. So again, I think, but WordPress is really hitting more of a uh, usability market. It's trying to get more into SaaS. It's hitting like less complex use cases, but it's focused more on that and not on the development side. Uh, the ready-made theming, big, big feature difference there. That's the one thing I definitely feel like Drupal needs to try to level up. Uh, there's still like a nice discovery catalog that I think is kind of what like the project browser is trying to do in Drupal, if you're all familiar with that. Uh, but it, it's really focused on removing the jargon and, and positioning the value and saying, hey, install this plugin and it's gonna do this thing for you, uh, which I think people, it makes it easier to install different features. And then the authoring experience, something like uh, Gutenberg was highlighted a number of different times as like a usability win for WordPress. All right, so now let's get into like, why, okay. Why is it called less secure? So I have, I have a, a hunch on this, okay? So my hunch is that if you're going after less technical people to use and adopt WordPress, they're not gonna update their site as much, right? So the real trick is like, you probably have way more WordPress instances that are in the world that just aren't even patched, right? Does that make WordPress less secure? I would say probably not, right? I bet WordPress itself is secure, right? Or at least as much as Drupal, right? Or probably comparable. I would imagine it's still vibrant, um, but I think this is this gives it a bad rep, and I don't think it's really warranted in that regard. I think it has a lot more to do with the kind of adoption that it has from from the field. That's my opinion. Okay, I told you there would be opinions. You got one. 
All right, uh, but it does have like less out of the box features than Drupal, uh, and some of their community has paid plugins, which actually kind of like hurts the open source part of it. Like if you sell, hey, WordPress is open source, and then all of a sudden you have to spend 20K for a license of like this plugin you want, yeah, that's not cool, right? Uh, and they also talked about how both performance and SEO were not strengths of WordPress, that like, you know, even the plugins weren't that great, or they needed a lot of massaging or a lot of help. Um, so yeah, there's that. All right, let's get into the fun part of the talk, all right? What about Drupal? So where, where really should Drupal go to kind of, you know, help the cause, right? The first one is around empowering the non-developer persona, right? We're so developer focused, but if we want to get more market, we need to go to where the market is, which is this non-developer persona. I really feel there needs to be a usability initiative, like getting way better documentation, way better like experience of using Drupal, hands-on with Drupal, and try to make that something that is prioritized by the community. I think if we do that, it would like lower the learning curve, it would make it easier to use, you know, uh, improve the documentation, all of these things, and I think would really, really benefit far more than just the developer ecosystem. And there should be more automated paths from like things like Simply Test Me, which I run, to get that into like a hosted solution or a paid solution, that people can have good pathways to get their Drupal sites kind of like moving uh, from ideation the whole way through launch, right? Uh, the one thing I also believe is that Drupal, because of its lack of identity right now, it needs to understand value-based marketing. We need to be doing storytelling of why Drupal features help our adopters, right? This is views. This is what views does. This is how you structure content. This is how you can theme it and make these like videos or these clips promoting these features so that people can see, oh, that's how I get value from Drupal. Oh, that's why it's so cool. Oh, that's why it's so configurable. And make it really, really focused on somebody that is not a developer, right? And I think it's super important. Uh, but if you make these like videos really highlighting its strengths and its power and all these things that we all know, but doing it in a way that can sell that for other people, I think that's a great way to get more adoption uh, to help start people's Drupal journey and get them excited about what Drupal does. My next claim is we need to be more competitive in small and medium markets, right? Automatic updates that Ted Bowman is working on will provide that through core. I think it goes deeper than that. I think we need to go around and look at the DevOps ecosystem and build more automation so that we can have better, you know, less friction and less technical stuff that can enable Drupal sites to automatically be updated all the time without any code, right? Uh, we need that out of the box stuff working and uh, kind of driving that forward. And we need to smooth the road so that people don't have to worry about backups or restoration or reporting errors. They should just, it should just go, right? And so I think that's one way to make Drupal a lot more compelling, uh, compelling for small to medium size. They don't want to maintain a site. They don't, okay? So like we should try to make that happen. We should try to enable that outcome, right? I also think that if you look at the top 20% of all modules, and you can pick whatever number you want, 10%, 5%, okay? Whatever, whatever you think is important, right? We need to invest heavily in the experience of using that top 20, top five, top 10% of those modules, right? Because those are the primary use cases that people are installing when they use Drupal. We should be making sure that it is as streamlined and great and the time to value is low the configuration is easy, the documentation is there, all of those things. We need to make sure that it's working. And for the love of God, we need to resolve the critical issues, okay? If there's stuff in the issue queue and people are saying like, wow, this thing like legitimately broke for me, we need to get them in and get them merged. We don't wanna like make everybody see all of our flaws every single time they install a module, right? Like that's crazy town. So, you know, we really need to make that kind of investment to make the experience of using these plugins much, much, much better, right? I fundamentally believe it. Um, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so my next positioning is we need stronger out-of-the-box features and faster time to value, okay? Configurable theme. Everybody was raving about this with WordPress. Like everything I read, oh yeah, you can theme really easily with WordPress. Why can't we do that in Drupal? We totally can. We should take Claro. We should take all the great work with Oliveira that Mike Herschel and others and Lori and uh, worked on and uh, Christina. 
take all that great work, but then build off of that. Make it so that anyone can go and take and install that right out of the box with Drupal, put in their themes, put in their colors, put in their fonts, put in their images, you know, just make it so easy to configure it. And then guess what? You've got something in core that immediately can like solve probably a large number of use cases, right? I think it'd be amazing, right? But then you also need to make sure that that applies very cleanly throughout the rest of core, like things like views and the field layouts and the displays, all those things need to be very tightly coupled to make sure that they are also themable so that, you know, somebody doesn't get like, you know, crazy font stuff coming in and displays that just don't look right on their site. So uh, I do, I think that would be amazing. Um, this one we talk, we'll talk about even more in just a second, but I really think that Drupal because it can do a lot of different things, should have, just like it has with Umami, like a recipe site, it should have a turnkey headless and a turnkey commerce solution right out of the box, right? You should be able to turn that on, right? And I think that would be really, really, really cool. And you don't have to worry about all the overhead of configuring it, you know, enabling modules, configuring those modules or whatever. The turnkey should hit the 80% use case and try to make that very streamlined and easy. So I built this talk, wrote this talk, did all the analysis before DrupalCon 2020. And then I actually was uh, able to contribute and give advice to Dries as part of the Dries note this year, which was cool. I enjoyed that a lot. And, uh, but long before I even looked at it, he talked about these concepts of project browser and extending project browser, and also this new thing called a starter template. And the starter template is exactly what I'm referring to about the headless turnkey and like the commerce turnkey, but making that enabling uh, from the community, building these projects, these starter templates that you can do upon install, pick which one you want as your starting point and launch off from there, right? Which I think would be really cool. But it's very clear to me that the shift that Dries made in the Dries note from ambitious digital experiences to ambitious site builder is very much in line with all the analysis that I did in this talk, okay? So I actually think it's quite cool, and I think that uh, without you know two people even talking about it, we drew some similar conclusions with different ideas that I think will move all of this forward. There's still room to go, but I thought it was a good thing. Thank you all so much. I hope this was a good talk. <laughs> Great to see all of you. I'll take questions. Slides about trends for Drupal landscape and WordPress. Do you have any on just the CMS marketing total? Uh, no, I don't think people. Um, you can take a look because there is different data. So like some was W three text and some was built with. So like built with was a little more generic. So there are more than, you know, there is some of the proprietary ones as an example. Uh, I think the W three text was focused on the frameworks only. So it was showing Drupal and WordPress and everything like that. Um, but um, I think the one that is probably closest to what you're asking was the built with uh, one that kind of like spanned more than like, you know, what framework was adopted basically. Uh, but it's, uh, I don't think there's anything that it like hits this cohesively or like, you know, completely. Uh, at least there wasn't anything that I found that I thought was hitting everything. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, yep. So, a great talk. Um, you know, while we're going through this whole thought process, I, I, I think it was 60% was still on Drupal 7. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. How many do you think will actually migrate to? If you could repeat the question. Uh, oh, sure. Um, the question was how many do I think would migrate mm -hmm. from Drupal 7? So, um, I, if I had to guess, and this is my opinion, and it's not validated against anything. This isn't a data-centered opinion. It's a pure opinion. Uh, I would say probably half because I, I think the ambitious digital experience mantra came in around Drupal 8 and I think that scared off some of the lower market, uh, say nonprofits or like, you know, more SMB style sites that maybe adopted Drupal uh, for seven. Um, but they don't know how to get it to eight. They don't know how to get it to nine or go to 10. So like, um, you know, there's, there's some friction there that I think if, depending on their business needs, they'll go either and say, I want something more SaaS-like, 
because I don't have to maintain it, or I'm going to make the investment because I see something that's coming with Drupal, and I already know Drupal, so I'm going to get over that hump and get over to the newer versions. I also think there is um, the Drupal 7 end of life keeps getting extended. Uh, largely, I mean, I think it's the right thing, you know, primarily for COVID especially. You don't want to put more stress on businesses right now than they're already under. So I think, you know, that could change things now that, you know, the pandemic is evolving and, and slowing down some or whatever it phase it's in right now. Sorry if that phrasing is not technically correct. But I think, um, again, my best guess is honestly more like a probably 50%. Um, because I think there's going to be lower market sites that when they build in Drupal 7, you didn't have the, the big, robust ecosystem of SaaS providers that you could go and purchase, right? So something like a Wix or a Squarespace, their features and their offerings are more compelling and more modern than they were back when Drupal 7 was adopted, right? And so it's a different ecosystem now, right? It's a, it's a different world. So, like, they have to make the right decision, but I don't think it's going to be 100%. I don't think it's going to be... Um, you know, it, unless if there's different incentives that come up that maybe help evolve them, whether it's migration assistance or maybe, you know, uh, better migration tooling or something like that that can, you know, grab stuff from a site and dump it into, you know, a Drupal 10 instance or whatever. But you, you miss the, the theming. You miss the um, custom, you know, features that maybe people built, like the modules, right, that they coded into their site. So I'm rambling a bit, but that's kind of why I'm thinking that. Uh, but again, don't take that as gospel. That's like my best guess. And, and you don't think they'll be as equally as high with like enterprise, um, you know, going to WordPress or? Oh, no, I, I feel that Drupal will continue to por uh, perform very strongly in enterprise. I think it's ex extremely well positioned to do that based on all of the analysis and all of the features and everything that, uh, that, I, uh, that I read about. So I don't, I don't see any threat to enterprise at all, yeah. At the, at the beginning of your talk, you posited that um, we don't talk about Drupal enough as a product. Yeah. And the problem there is, it's not a product. When, when in, in the enterprise, when we're doing competitive analysis with other potential digital experience platforms, Drupal always loses out because, you know, everyone's kind of says, well, there's Sitecore, and there's Adobe Experience Manager, and there's Acquia. And it's not Acquia. And, you know, right. Acquia is a company that does a pass. And, you know, there, there is no thing that you can say, well, that's Drupal, because Drupal is kind of spread out. Yeah, it's more ubiquitous, right. So, I, you know, how, how do you productize something when there's no central point of I'm going to go there and get... Yeah, I think, like, so the question is, how do you productize something like Drupal that is more of a framework or capability or open source, like, you know? But I think your um, basis for saying that is around companies and selling it, right? Uh, where, you know, Acquia doesn't own Drupal, right? And oh, exactly. far from it, right? Uh, and now it is an enterprise partner, much like a lot of agencies are enterprise partners of Drupal too, right? And so um, I think it's different, but I still think you can look at it like a product. And the reason why I'm saying it is product as a discipline is actually looking at things like the market, the strengths, the weaknesses, the analysis. And from that lens alone, Drupal is a product, right? But it's not a paid product. It's not, off, you know, it's not like exclusively offered by a company like a Salesforce or a Wix or a Squarespace. So, but I don't think the definition of a product strictly adheres to just who sells it. I think it's a philosophy. I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. But the, the issue is, you know, coming from an enterprise organization that is buying platforms as a service. Yep. Yeah. When, when you're doing a comparison and you go to, you know, you can call up Sitecore and say, send a sales rep and go through everything that you can do. Go to Adobe, same thing, or, or whoever else. There, there is no central place, really. You have to 
hire somebody mm -hmm. to do it, you know, and it could be Aquila, <coughs> it could be Zip Tech, it could be... Yeah, yeah. sure. And, but, you know, those are small players relative to, say, at Adobe, and it makes it really, it puts Drupal in a difficult competitive position. Sure, yeah, it, I mean, the way I, I look at it slightly differently, but I agree, it doesn't have, like, the the enterprise backing like a proprietary product does. And sorry, maybe that's poor phrasing. Like the the money, like the investment trains like that these, you know, things do, right? Uh, but I think that's actually what makes Drupal great though. Like, I mean, honestly, let's be real, right? Like that's, we all contribute to making Drupal better. And that makes it not proprietary. That makes it not, you know, corporate and not like about putting money in exec's pocket, but actually making everybody in the whole community better through the product, right? And so I think it has a way stronger way that it can be advocated for from that lens. And honestly, open source on the whole is really exploding. I mean, like people are in, in the entire world are, you know, using open source and favoring open source far more than they ever have in the past, right? Uh, it used to be taboo. Like, I remember back when I worked at Penn State, like, years and years and years ago, where they're like, oh, what is this open source thing? It's kind of scary. Like, the code's there, and, like, what's going on? Like, no, that's a strength. Because you might be running really bad code from your proprietary vendor, but you can't see it, right? All because it's there, you know, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Like, so I think there's actually a ton of, like, positive elements of this that actually make Drupal something far more compelling than going proprietary. But it doesn't have like the, the you know, venture capital money pumping into Drupal because there isn't like a central entity, right? There isn't, you know, you can't like, uh, but also I think that's good, it's more wholesome, right? If you look at something like, uh, you know, uh, the Cloud Native Foundation, right? They have major backers, Microsoft, Google, all these other things, right? But they also help shape and drive the roadmap, right? They pay to make it better for their customers, whereas I think something like Drupal is more for the people. It's more for us, right? Which I think is great. I, 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 I mean, I want to echo what Jeff's saying. It's, it's like, we bring up the more value. It's, there, there needs to be a, a better pitch for Drupal, and it's interesting. Like, and I, I, something that I kind of was reading into your slides was, the 36% share of WordPress, and I'll get to my point from there, what percent of that is WordPress.com, which is backing it as a, you know, like that platform service is pumping WordPress sites out. Yep. So that's, that share is a little off, or it's a little hard to know what's really, I don't know, people. That's a great point. Using the yep. product, installing the product, working with the product. And conversely, I think we've got to own the impact that Aqua has on the Drupal community, because when you put that list of features up there, there's some really key that Aqua is providing that are helping the Drupal community move forward. When someone wants to build a, a DXP, Drupal's not doing that. I mean, Drupal's capable of composing a DXP, but those pieces are out there. You know, Aqua is one example. They're out there all over the place. I think that's one of the things we have to play up is the composability of Drupal and the pieces. Like the Salesforce module is an incredible product that yeah. probably we. You know, you have your top twenty percent modules, and there's this other sector. If that's not in the top twenty percent, but to re the Salesforce module is ridiculously important for people selling Drupal. It, sa it saves them millions of dollars because they don't have to purchase licensing fees for every single. Right. So I think, like, to kind of cut to what I understand to be the main point is Drupal really is the enabler in all of that as the foundation, and that is, I think, how the value-based marketing of the talk needs to sh to emphasize is like where do you get that value how do you use it as that kind of a capability right um so i yeah i agree uh I, yeah i saw your hand up in your research what's the difference between people learning how to use and implement drupal versus wordpress um so i think the the general vibe is uh that you know that WordPress is more catered towards a simpler and less configurable case, which hurt, uh, helps the usability of it. Um, whereas I think the, ge the general thing that I kept reading and hearing is 
people that made the investment of learning Drupal felt that they got more from it. They actually felt that that was an investment worth making. So that was kind of the positioning I read, like sort of the you know the tea leaves, so to say, from all the different blog posts. Because uh, because at the end of the day, when they learned the different ways to make it more extensible, or they learned the different features, they were able to apply them easily and more readily, and in in the future, for other uh, use cases or other sites that they were developing, right? But is that learning still continuing? Like, are there more Drupal developers now, or are there less? That's a good question. Um, I didn't pull any of that data. I didn't pull any, like, uh, from the developer ecosystem. I, I tend, like, the talk tend to look at Drupal kind of more outward. Uh, so I didn't pull any stats from, like, Drupal.org as an example. But I know that Dries, every year, writes a blog post on, like, the... Uh, the metrics that come out of Drupal.org and the contributions, and he analyzes those. And, and I think that blog post, um, I would imagine we're probably due for another one soonish. I don't remember the exact timing. Uh, but that would be better able to answer the question you're asking. Because I think that contributes a lot. And speaking from a user perspective, yeah. it's so hard to find Drupal talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I know the DA tried to help out with that, where they have this cohort of uh, people that they're training to, you know, um, get into the Drupal community, basically. So, like, I think that's one program I know that is trying to address that need. Um, but, I, you know, it does take time. Like, if you learn it, you know, to become more senior, more expert in the platform, you need to understand a lot about it. And, um, yeah, and I, I've been there, so I understand, you know, and... Uh, um, I think you raised some very good points. Um, I don't want to keep anybody from lunch because we're already over, so thank you. Have a great day.